Ramiro is ready to go and he's going to tell us about non-compact Einstein manifolds with symmetry. Thanks, Ramiro. All right. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction and thanks both you and John for the invitation to give this talk. It's an honor to be here. Let me start by explaining the words in the title, although you might know all of them, just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so I'll talk about Einstein manifolds, right? Just because we are in the in a flows conference, let me define this as a trivial Ricci flow. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I'll be focusing on Einstein manifolds with negative Einstein constants. So in this talk, Einstein will mean Rich G equals minus G because up to scaling, I can always renormalize the Einstein constant to be minus one. So these are of course trivial expanding Ricci solitons. So this is yeah, Einstein manifolds. And uh, by the way, I should have mentioned this is all joint work with Christoph Böhm from Münster. And by symmetry in this talk, I mean that there's a connected Lie group G. Is there an issue? Um, no, 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 it's okay. Fine. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, acting on this uh, Riemannian manifold MG isometrically. And I'll also assume throughout that the action is co compact. By this, I mean, of course, that the orbit space is a compact topological space, metric space. And then I guess I have to say, why don't I add the non compact? This is not necessary, but uh, they are actually non compact because um, Bochner's theorem from the 50s tells you that Ricci negative plus compact M implies that the isometry group must be finite. So of course, you're not gonna have a connected Lie group positive dimension acting isometrically and non-trivially. And so that's just a property of these solutions. And so let me start with the, the case we were interested in to begin with, uh, which is a homogeneous case. So this is like the most symmetric case uh, and this is where the orbit space is a point. So namely the action of the Lie group is uh, transitive, right? So in this case, you can always write M as a homogeneous space. So a quotient of G by a closed Lie group H, which is just uh, the stabilizer at one point, right? So let me mention a few examples in case you're not that familiar with this. Well, you know a few. So this hyperbolic space, for instance, is a homogeneous space, which is negative Einstein manifold. And then you can you have other like complex hyperbolic space. And in general, any non-compact irreducible symmetric space. Um, and let me just remind you what a symmetric space is. Uh, from the algebraic point of view, this is a quotient of a simple Lie group G by a maximal compact subgroup. So of course, these are very famous Riemannian manifolds, right? Probably the nicest ones because they've got a lot of symmetry. And they provide examples of Einstein manifolds. There's a lot more, right? So there's deformations of these things, and there's infinite families of like depending on several parameters. It's a, there's a huge zoo of uh, Einstein homogeneous manifolds. And perhaps uh, another motivation, given the context of this conference, is that why would you care about homogeneous Einstein manifolds? Well, I think they are nice, but if you don't think they are nice, they're still interesting for non-homogeneous flow solutions. So for instance, John Lott proved in, in 2010 that if you have a, a three-dimensional type three Ricci flow, so this is a solution that is immortal and it's a type three. So curvature decays at the rate of T to the minus one and M is closed. And moreover, you assume a 
the condition on the diameter that it grows like t to the one half, then he proves that the pullback solution on the universal cover approaches in a very specific sense, a homogeneous expanding soliton. So most of what I'm gonna talk about today also holds if you replace Einstein by soliton, but let me just focus on the Einstein case for, for simplicity. So these homogeneous expanding solitons appear as singularity models at infinity of immortal rich flows in dimension three. Of course, we don't expect this to hold in high dimensions, but still, uh, I will explain later why is it uh, you need to take care of symmetries when studying this uh, long time behavior of Ricci flows. Uh, and it's also related to what uh, Stephen was talking about collapsing and non collapsing, etc. So let me mention perhaps the most important problem in, in the setting of homogeneous Einstein spaces of negative Einstein constant was this. Uh, conjecture due to Alexievsky. He conjectured this in 1975. And the conjecture says that uh, if Mg is a homogeneous Einstein space with negative Einstein constant, then as a manifold, it must be diffeomorphic to a Euclidean space. So topologically trivial. And then the main result I want to discuss today is joint work with uh, Christoph Boom, be it last year in the archive, is that the conjecture holds. So the Alexievsky conjecture is true. So I hope uh, that I'm able to explain what are the main at least geometric ideas involved in the proof. I will try to suppress uh, the algebra as much as possible in case the audience is not that familiar with Lie theory and all that. Um, but yeah, this is like so, the main result. So this has an analog for expanders as well. Yeah, so same same result holds for, I guess if you say expanding homogeneous rigid solitons, mm -hmm. they must be diffeomorphic to R. Oh. But the proof is just, uh, I, yeah. It followed immediately by like previous work. So oh, okay. uh, the core part is the, the Einstein case. And I should perhaps mention previous results. So I'm just going to name a few people that worked on this problem and have very interesting results. So let me, not all of them perhaps, but this Romina Arroyo has some results in, in this direction, Jens Heber. Uh, Mike Jablonski, uh, Jorge Lauret, Yuri Nikolaevsky. I can't say what each one, everyone did individually, but uh, they all contributed some partial results. Yuri Nikonorov, uh, Peter Peterson, and, and perhaps I'm forgetting about a lot of people. So. And yeah, they, they all proved partial results or particular cases of the conjecture. Um, so now, uh, is there any question about the, the statement or the theorem? So if, if there's no questions, then let me sort of change gears here and start part two of the talk, which is not about homogeneous spaces anymore. So I will now talk about the general case of the setting that I just presented. So there's, a, there's an Einstein manifold, which in general will be non-compact. And there's a group G acting isometrically co-compactly. But now I assume that the dimension of the orbit space is arbitrary, right? So it's not a point anymore. It's not even dimension one. It could be arbitrary. So that's just any D group action on an Einstein manifold. And for simplicity, although we don't need this, but it's useful to assume this, assume that the quotient is a manifold. So in general, 
it's not going to be a manifold, but there's an open dense set in M, which is invariant under G and for which the quotient there is a smooth manifold. But in general, uh, the quotient will have singularities. Uh, so it's of course a stratified space, uh, but let's just assume it's a manifold. There are some tricks that we can play so that uh, everything reduces to this case as some frame bundle formulations, et cetera. But I don't want to get too technical. Um, and yeah, and then let me now mention why would you care about Einstein manifolds with symmetry? So which are invariant under some isometric group action. And, and to me, that's a very good motivation for studying this, even if you don't, if you're not interested in the previous conjecture. So the, the thing is that to prove the homogeneous Alexievsky conjecture, we need to go through the business of considering group actions which are not transitive, but we have where the quotient has arbitrary dimension, right? So that's why we became interested in this setup. And, but then uh, one realizes that actually, uh, if you study Ricci flows, which are immortal, unfortunately, they're not ancient, but uh, uh, I guess Matt still allowed me to give the talk. <laughs> so it is fine. Uh, so blowdowns, parabolic blowdowns of type three, immortal Ricci flows on a closed manifold are uh, in general collapsed. So by this, I mean that the gromov hausdorff limit has dimension uh, smaller than the dimension of the starting sequence. So this is what collapse means in the intrinsic case. So you can always take a limit in the metric space sense and, and you can make sense of the house of dimension of the limit. But if this is smaller than N, then we say the sequence is collapsed or also equivalently, if there's no lower bound for the injectivity radius. Uh, but there, because they are type three, the blowdowns will have a bounded curvature, bounded sectional curvature. So then there's a extremely deep and important uh, theory by Jigger, Fukaya, and Gromov started in the late 80s and culminated in the mid 90s that tells you that under this situation, amazingly, this collapse has to happen along the fibers, I mean, approximately along the fibers of an isometric, uh, the orbits of an isometric group action. So asymptotically, so I'm not claiming that there's, there appears a group which acts isometrically, but as you become more and more collapsed, the metric will become very, very close to a metric which has symmetries. And the collapse occurs along the orbits of this uh, group action. Collapsing occurs up to covering, well, I'm, I'm being vague here for the sake of clarity, but uh, along the orbits of an isometric group action. And the group is actually near potent. The group. Um, so then if you want to study uh, the limit behavior of a immortal Ricci flow, in general, you will expect that, I mean, if it's, if it's, you can assume that it's non-collapsed, in which case there's a, there's a limit with almost everywhere, it will become Einstein. But in general, the situation is that the solution will collapse and, and then you have to care about, you know, the, the easiest possible way of collapsing is when you have these symmetries and this actually govern the general case asymptotically. So, so that's why it's interesting to look at I mean, Einstein's are, Einstein metrics are trivial Ricci flows, right? So maybe this is the first step towards understanding uh, long time behavior of collapsed Ricci flows. So I think this is a strong enough motivation for looking at these things. But in this talk, we're gonna focus on Einstein manifolds only. And, and yeah, from the Chigar Fukaya Gromov theorem, you, you get a near potent D group acting. Uh, so in general, our group G is not near potent 
However, the nil potency will play an important role. I mean, if you don't know what nil potent means, just think of a of a Lie group of uh, strictly upper triangular matrices with then ones on the diagonal. So any Lie group like that will be nil potent. And these are all. Uh, so for any Lie group G, there's a there's a maximal nil potent subgroup which is called the nil radical and plays an important role in our structure results. So I have to define it. This is a maximal nil potent normal subgroup of G connected, I guess. So for, e for example, if G is a group of say upper triangular matrices C by three, then N is a subgroup of strictly upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal. Okay, so this is called the Heisenberg. Um, now, because G acts isometrically on M, then also N acts isometrically on M. The main difference is that it, the, the quotient is not going to be compact in this case, right? And when, when you have an isometric group action where the orbit is a smooth manifold, there's a Riemannian submersion where the, the fibers are just the orbits of this group action. So there exists a, a metric on the quotient so that this the quotient projection becomes a Riemannian submersion. And for people who like um, gauge theory, this is also a principal end bundle. All right, so I need to mention that because uh, our structure results is about uh, this Riemannian submersion. Um, so just imagine, right, that you have M here and then the orbits, these are non-compact orbits of N in M, and these are the N orbits. And then there's a projection onto the quotient and the quotient will have, I don't know, some topology, whatever, right? And, and there are vertical directions, right? Which are tangent to the orbit. And there are so-called horizontal directions which are orthogonal to the orbits, right? So this will become important later on. So there's a vertical distribution in M, which is given by just the tangent spaces to the orbits. That's of course an integral distribution. And then the metric allows you to define this H, the, or the horizontal distribution, right? Which is not necessarily integral, of course. And so now theorem B, It's about uh, saying something about the uh, Einstein manifold with symmetry in this generality. So let's assume M is a complete Einstein manifold with negative Einstein constant and let G act isometrically and co-compactly then a number of things have to happen. So first of all, the horizontal distribution is integrable. And secondly, the N orbits, which are submanifolds of M with the submanifold geometry, they become uh, homogeneous expanding solitons. So you somehow inherit the condition that you have for the ambient space, you inherit it for the orbits, which is nice. And then uh, there's very good control on the second fundamental form in the direction of the mean curvature vector of the N orbits. And let me just say that this second fundamental form is uh, 
explicitly known. I don't want to give you the formula, but you, you know it and it's sort of constant. Um, all right, so I mean, this doesn't sound very appealing. I agree. Uh, it's just the, the sole fact that you are able to say something uh, with an arbitrary uh, group action is already a lot, right? And, and this is so general that we can then apply it for the homogeneous case and obtain non-trivial estimates that allow us to prove the, the Alexievsky conjecture. Um, so perhaps I should uh, ask if there are any questions on the statement. Um, can I ask a question? Right yes, here? Glenn. Uh, yeah, so just about point three, when you say like is explicitly known, like, do you want to just I might have to say more, right? So, so means. let me. Um, so, I guess if you view H, I mean, so the second fundamental form as a as a one one tensor on M, right? You can write it in terms of the horizontal plus vertical distribution as like a you know, two by two matrix, right? So, I claim that is zero 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 and something which. Uh, we know it. we know all the eigenvalues there, right? And they are constant. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so you know it. I don't want to say what the eigenvalues are, but um, but you know them, and they are constant. They depend on n essentially. They are God given, so to speak, mm -hmm. and they are constant. Of course, there's gonna be rotations when you as you move along the orbit, uh, because nothing is totally geodesic, mm -hmm. but but the eigenvalues are constant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's cool. And and. That means that if you regard H, because H is horizontal, so it's of course pi related to a vector field on, on the quotient, right? So you could think of the mean curvature vector as a vector field here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an invariant horizontal vector field. So it, it's uniquely related to a vector field here via pi. Uh, so as a vector field here, it's a parallel vector mm -hmm. because, of, uh, because of this zero here. Right. So that, that's a lot of uh, structure there. Right. But the, the key point here, I guess, is this one, that H is integrable, because in the setup of, uh, so let me remind you that I said that given the metric G, you obtain this decomposition into vertical and horizontal distributions for the tangent bundle. And H in the setting of gauge theory and, and principal bundle, this is what's called a principal connection for the principal bundle. Mm -hmm. So the Riemannian metric gives you a principal connection. This is the definition of a principal connection. I'm not making any simplification. And uh, the item I, uh, one, sorry, says that uh, this connection, this principal connection is flat. Right. So the Einstein condition forces flatness of uh, this principal connection. So for instance, Young-Mills equation is about, you know, Starting the curvature of, of this principal connection. Right? And, and this is equivalent for those who are familiar with O'Neill's formulas. So O'Neill's A tensor vanishes. I mean, the A tensor in O'Neill's formulas for the Riemannian submersion is precisely the curvature of this principal connection. Um, all right, so maybe let me mention a some example to prove that this is not an empty theorem. I should have mentioned perhaps one example of, a, of an item manifold with symmetry, which is say not homogeneous, right? Um, and the example is going to be a bit boring perhaps because uh, I'm gonna consider a Riemannian product of a compact Einstein manifold. So this is a Riemannian product of a compact Einstein and a homogeneous Einstein. So not very interesting, but there are tons of examples. Now, this ex the fact that I cannot tell you a more interesting example is uh, suggests that there might be more behind this, right? So let me write our third theorem, which I will not comment on because this is very fresh. It has not appeared yet on the archive, but it will in the coming weeks. Um, so let's consider again, Einstein manifold, negative Einstein constant. 
and there's a group acting isometrically and co-compactly, but let us throw in another assumption, which I don't want to explain. Let's assume that G is a unimodular Lie group. Most Lie groups that you can think of are going to be unimodular. Like for instance, semi-simple Lie groups, compact Lie groups, near potent Lie groups, they're all unimodular. Um, but this is an assumption, right? Then up to the finite cover, the manifold, so the orbits split off isometrically. So M is isometric up to the finite cover to so the product of a compact Einstein manifold E and a symmetric space. Okay. So actually this example is somehow very general. In the case that the group is unimodular, we obtain a complete classification of the symmetries that any Einstein manifold can have. Right? Is this something that applies to solitons as well? Uh, that I don't know. Let's, let's say no for the moment. Yeah. Uh, no, this is special for, to Einstein. Yeah, so this uh, I consider the strongest uh, structural theorem for Einstein manifold with symmetry that we have. Um, because it's much more than saying that the orbits have integral, I mean, that the horizontal distribution is integral. You also have to prove that the orbits are totally geodesic, right? And it's just a lot more work. Anyway, let me, uh, if there are no questions about the statements, let me try to explain how we prove uh, theorem B, and I'll try to talk mainly about the ideas and not about like any specific formula. Um, so okay, so when you have a when you have a metric on the total space of a Riemannian submersion, then this metric is determined by three objects, namely. So remember, there's a Riemannian submersion here, right? So the metric is determined by the metric on the base by the principal connection H and by a family of metrics on the fibers, on the N orbits. So this is a family of left invariant metrics on N, which is parameterized by the orbit space, of course. So this information allows you to recover uh, a whole, every curvature you want to think about from G. Um, and then the Einstein condition, which is just what Ricci equals minus the metric. So if you write Ricci in terms of like the Riemannian submersion, namely the vertical, vertical part, the vertical horizontal part, and the horizontal, horizontal part you'll get uh, three equations here, which are equivalent, like a system of couples equations, PDEs, that are equivalent to this uh, PDE here. So I'm not gonna write the equations explicitly. You can look at any of the papers, either our paper or the other papers that I'll mention in a minute, but let me just give you an idea of what type of equations you get. So the vertical part is like a harmonic map type of equation for this family of metrics on N. And we call this E1. Then the, the off-diagonal one is a Young-Mills type of equation for the connection. And the, and the base, the horizontal part of the equation is a soliton type equation for the metric on the base. But when I say type, I mean, I mean, this is far from being the soliton equation, right? So there's some terms which depend on the, the second fundamental form and, and the A tensor. So, so, so you need to, yeah, you can, you don't get anything for free, unfortunately. Um, so what's the strategy for proving uh, 
theorem B, right? So we have an I, we have these equations being satisfied and then we need to prove that the curvature of H is zero. So the idea is to, it's very simple, is we apply the maximum principle on the compact, on the closed manifold M mod G uh, to a suitable function. And what do I mean by that? So we need to find a nice function. Say, say we find a function on M, which is G invariant, so that it gives you a function on the quotient and for which we can prove uh, a PDE, a, a partial differential inequality of the form, say Laplace and F plus some first order term greater than or equal to zero, right? So suppose we have such a function. Of course, to show this estimate, we will use heavily the Einstein equation, right? And, and then hopefully the estimate is such that equality is attained uh, or implies uh, that, that the horizontal distribution is um, integral. Right, so there will be some term here of the form norm of a square that you throw away, right? Mm. And then you hope to find such a function because mm. if you if you are able to do that, because m mod g is compact smooth manifold, then by the maximum principle f has to be constant, and therefore uh, you get a quality point wise everywhere, and therefore this holds a anything that you use to prove this inequality there has to hold everywhere, right? So that's a strategy. It's very naive if I say it like that, uh, it, but it's not, uh, we were not the first to think about such a strategy. So let me mention previous related uh, work on the Einstein equation with symmetries. So there's uh, work by uh, Rong in the 98, uh, where he studied the negative Einstein equation with a uh, abelian symmetry. Then uh, there's more recent work by John Lott, 2020, and by uh, Aaron Neighbor and Gang Tian, published in 2018. And they study uh, the Ricci flat case. I mean, they, they, their papers are about more general situation, but at the end of the day, the, the proof boils down to understanding Ricci flat metrics with symmetries, right? And in this case, uh, so in the case of Lot, the, the, the group is also abelian and neighbor Tian considered near potent groups, right? Um, so in all of these papers, they follow precisely this strategy that I mentioned here. And actually the function is always the same function, right? So I'm just, I'm, I'm not saying that all of these papers are just the same. I'm saying that at the core of the proofs of the main result, you find these arguments, right? They, they have to obtain rigidity for the Einstein equation with symmetries. And how do they obtain that? By a maximum principle for a function, which is the following, is a relative volume density of the orbits. So what do I mean by that? And well, one way of writing this is uh, <clears throat> saying that I take, take a basis, fixed basis for the Lie algebra of the group, right? So because the group is acting isometrically, this vector fields and uh, this uh, each vector in the Lie algebra gives rise to uh, a killing vector field on the manifold. Let's span the vertical 
distribution, right? The tangent space is to the orbits. So with this global frame of killing fields spanning the vertical distribution, you set then gij to be, well, the metric evaluated at these killing fields. And then you set, I call it vn for the group n, which is a square root of the determinant of this matrix. This is of course a function on M and it's invariant under N. It's a G invariant function on M, uh, sorry, an N invariant function on M. Uh, and then it turns out that the function logarithm of VN works in all of this, at least when N is abelian. Okay, so why why does this make sense? I mean, you don't have to believe blindly in what I say. Just imagine what happens when you take the second derivatives of this thing, right? The determinant will become some sort of trace and second derivative of metric with curvature will appear, right? So then it's not surprising that Ricci curvature appears in the Laplacian of V, right? And when Ricci curvature appears, then you throw in the the Einstein equations, right? Hoping to obtain the differential inequality. And, and this is precisely what happens, right? And you need to throw away the, the norm of A square term. All right, so then uh, the hope is to just try and do the same. I should mention that we didn't realize, uh, we were not aware of these uh, papers when we proved our theorem. So we later realized that they follow the same approach. But it's actually funny that the, it's it's a very similar approach. Now the, the problem with our situation is that uh, this doesn't work. So the relative volume density of the n orbits doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Well, because of two main problems. So first of all, when the group is not abelian, so when the group is abelian, the orbits are intrinsically flat because any metric which is invariant under an abelian group action is a flat metric, right? So then the geometry of the orbits does not play a role. Now, when the group is not abelian, uh, you need to take into account the geometry of the orbits. So if n is not abelian, then uh, the geometry of the n orbits will appear in the first equation, in the vertical Einstein equation, in this harmonic map type uh, equation. And this is a, a problem, right? I mean, none of the estimates will work if, if, that, uh, if, 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 the, if the orbits are not flat. Now, a second issue, and this is uh, actually even worse than that, is that this function, the relative volume density of the n orbits, we can also consider it, but it's not going to be g invariant. So remember that we had a larger group g, and then n was only a subgroup of g, and we need a g invariant function to apply the maximum principle because we only know that m mod g is compact. m mod n is not compact. It's never compact unless n is g. So, so there's no maximum principle, right? Uh, nothing will be true if you have a non compact If you cannot guarantee that this uh, that this function achieves, and in general it doesn't, right? So there are counter examples when the quotient is not compact. So you need a g invariant function, and so this one doesn't work. So let me tell you briefly how we address these two issues. Uh, so for the first one. We actually consider a, a similar sort of determinant of the metric. So we use what I call a weighted determinant or volume density. So what do I mean by that? I mean, some expression of the form, and I'm being vague on purpose here. Say so you take the product of, so assume that the you have an, the basis diagonalizes the metric tensor everywhere. Assume you are so lucky that this happens, right? 
then you take the, the product of the eigenvalues of the metric raised to a certain power, right? So this is not the determinant. Um, so the power depends on the eigenvalue, right? But it's the same for all points. It's a fixed set of weights. Um, which are rational numbers, uh, which is determined by the Lie group N after uh, a certain machinery is applied. So after applying um, geometric invariant theory. on the space of Lie brackets. So I'm just throwing in some words here so that you have some idea of where this is coming from. The, the upshot is that uh, in this, on the space of Lie brackets. Yeah, the upshot is that this function actually and these weights are designed so that they take into account the geometry and the, more precisely the Ricci curvature of the n orbits. So this is, Precisely what you need in order to get an estimate when the orbits are not flat. Do you define it as a product of the powers of the eigenvalues? As if if the metric okay. would be simultaneously diagonalizable, yes. But if not, not you need uh, you need yeah. to do some trick. Like you need to find basis where the some sort of gram schmitz process where the mm. the make like can express it in terms of a positive, uh, not a positive definite, an invertible triangular matrix. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the eigenvalues there. Yeah. Okay. So you can always find a triangular matrix to write any you know, inner product in terms of a fixed one. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Um, so, so somehow, yeah, it is more complicated. Uh, yeah. There's more linear algebra, yeah. non-trivial linear algebra involved. This, I guess, is it? Uh, no, there's a there's like a there's like a non-trivial step in between that I'm throwing under the rug. And uh, also this this function here, we didn't come up with this function in this particular paper, but this was a key uh this played a key role in uh, the construction of the entropy formula for uh, immortal homogeneous Ricci flows. That this is a previous joint work with Christoph in 2017. And so we knew about the existence of this formula and, and we thought, well, this orbits, they don't satisfy a Ricci flow, but they satisfy some PDE which involves Ricci. So why not trying this? And, and, and it turns out that it's, it gives you something, but it's not enough, unfortunately. Then, uh, then we also need the actual volume or something related to the volume density of the n orbits. And then, but instead of looking at the volume density of the n orbits, uh, first, let me recall that this function that worked in, in, in all these papers, right? The, the log of Vn, if you take the gradient of this function, then you get a very familiar object, namely the mean curvature. So this is well known in the case of group actions. The mean curvature vector is a, is a gradient vector field of, of the relative volume density. Um, so now let's try to play some similar game here, right? So let's, so let's recall that the H is uh, minus gradient log Vn, right? So what if we, I mean, okay, Vn is not G invariant, but what if we try to write H as say the gradient of some function plus some error term where the error term satisfies some PDE that makes you know this error not hurt you so much in the in the estimate, right? When you compute second derivatives and Laplace and etc. Right. So of course the first naive approach would be to say say try to aim for like diversion h equals zero. So that when you take diversions of this, which is the same as Laplacian of V, right? It disappears. But of course, this is too naive because this will imply on a compact manifold uh, that the composition of a vector field into a gradient plus a diversion-free vector field is unique. 
essentially because of the uniqueness of the Poisson equation solution. So then um, this is called the Helmholtz decomposition, I guess, or there are other names, but this implies that H has to be zero, essentially because we know that H is already a gradient vector. The only problem is that the potential is not G invariant, right? So actually what works here, and don't ask me why, because we don't understand why, what works is uh, to require that H satisfies this PDE involving V. So then the claim is that there exists there exists a positive function V on, on M, which is G invariant, such that the mean curvature vector of the N orbit can be written as minus gradient of logarithm V plus some error where the error satisfies divergence of V times that guy is zero, right? So this is equivalent to saying that V satisfies a certain second order linear equation, obviously, um, in terms of HN, just write it down and this is what you get, right? It's a second order PDE, which has uh, this term here, which is slightly complicated, but it's linear. Now, the key thing is that you need the solution to this. There's a unique solution up to scaling, but you need the solution to satisfy positivity condition, right? Because you want to take the logarithm. Uh, so so the, there's, a, there's a tiny PDE uh, yeah, result that we need to prove here that solutions to this linear PDE do not change sign. And, but it turns out to be true. Essentially, because um, the conjugate equation satisfies the maximum principle. And then, okay, and once you get that, uh, then you add that to your uh, previous function, and it still doesn't work. So, uh, there's another correction term which involves the norm of this error mean curvature vector. Uh, and this turns out uh, that it yields the desired estimate. It's G invariant and it gives you the estimate that you wanted and equality happens if and only if all these things that I mentioned vanish. Uh, um, so that's, that's, that's uh, essentially the idea. I hope it didn't get too involved. I think it is maybe slightly complicated. Um then, I mean, yeah, you can use theorem B for proving theorem A. Um, uh, that becomes uh, more algebraically involved. You need to use the, the Eva Sawa decomposition and, and all that. But uh, then I think this is a good time to stop. So yeah, thanks for your attention. Any questions? Go ahead. In this last bit, Ramiro, um, if you look at that equation, I've got two screens which show the same thing. It's really weird, but you see the equation for HN. Yes. Um, if you test that against the V and you take the div, yes, then you get an expression for div V H, right? Yes. Uh, and I you said this is a diversion equation. Yeah, it's, it's diversion. Type. You yeah. can write it as a diversion. So, yeah. So is that how you get? Do you get? Do you get a sign on that? lower order coefficient or no no it doesn't have a sign no it, when you take the so i guess the question is whether this has a sign but it doesn't because uh diversion h doesn't it integrates to zero yeah yeah so it doesn't have a sign yeah that's your uh, average yeah that's right yeah but it, but it, it's not zero so therefore uh, this doesn't have a sign but when you this is a linear operator right so the l star has a like a zero order term, which has a sign, I guess that's, yeah. So that's what so, makes so that, so then it satisfies the maximum not, yeah, principle. Yeah, that's fine, this, even if it's not positive, yeah, it's still positive. Um, but this one doesn't satisfy the maximum principle, right? Um, 
I don't know. I, I'm yeah. happy to get suggestions because we ask a lot of people, and uh, I guess yeah, Lainey wrote a paper on this particular, you know, like positivity of the first eigenfunction, and and he didn't know how to justify it in this situation. Yeah. He said it, it must be true, but uh, so yeah, it's yeah, it, it's not always true, right? It's not true for any uh, for any coefficient. Yeah, yes. you need to be lucky, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I was asking, how do you know that you're lucky? But that's your answer, so it's okay. Yeah. So you got the conjugate equation. You got to the conjugate. Yeah. yeah. So this was actually an idea by uh, Hayo Hein. Uh, he he helped us uh, prove that. Uh, so he considers yeah, the, the the conjugate equation and, and does some maximum principle type of arguments on the right function spaces. And... Okay, then let, let's thank our speakers from this morning again, even though Stephen's not here. But... Thanks. Thank you.